delighted to be here. What a wonderful day. I'm excited anytime people want to listen to an old soldier's musings. So <laughs> let, let's get started. What is this contraption? Well, this jumped back in 1828, and it's a thing that uh, you'll get used to. Just talk into it and make your voice really well, loud. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here. What a wonderful country you have. It's the first time I've been back here. It's, what has it been? Uh, just over 50 years ago, when we were down here fighting with General Marion at Fort Mott. Get, but I get ahead of myself. Let me back up to June uh, 1780. Some of you I see have enough white hair to remember those days, 50-some uh, years ago. Well, by the way, how many of you grew up in this area? Wasn't it a wonderful place to grow up? How many of you grew up in, uh, did anyone grow up in the upstate? Oh, good, you must, we're probably cousins. You know, we're Scots-Irish Scots Presbyterians. That's what, what we were, and very proud of it, I might say. Um, I was there just, oh, well, now it's called Union of South Carolina. Maybe you're familiar with Union South Carolina. But of course, at that time, it was nothing but a bunch of plantations till we built the Presbyterian Meeting House and began to, people began to move in. Uh, well, I remember it like yesterday. It was in June, and I heard this wailing. I was in the barn working on a, on a harness or something, and I don't quite remember. But I heard this wailing and this crying. It was just terrible, and I knew immediately it was my mother. And I rushed out of the house, and there she is on the front porch with Uncle Thomas. That's Colonel Thomas Brandon, one of the co-commanders of our a little river regiment and he was there and I knew something tragic must have happened because she I've never heard her like this it had to be either my father who was a captain uh, in the in the, that unit and or my brother John who was 18 years old and I was just 16 well I rushed up there as fast as I could go and sure enough she broke loose from Uncle Thomas and she said it's John it's John they've killed John folks it's the biggest shock of my life even to this day when I'm 65 years old Biggest shock. I couldn't believe it. I said, what happened? Uncle Thomas explained. He says, it was Bloody Bill Cunningham. You remember if you've been around Bloody Bill Cunningham. He was a notorious Tory who throughout the upstate area and places elsewhere, all the way even down to Charleston later in 1781, this guy would kill you whether you were fighting against him or not. And uh, so he was a terrible person. Well, what happened? I inquired, and Uncle Thomas said, explained it was Adam Steedham. Now, Adam Steedham was the most vile man in our entire territory. He was one of those fence sitters. You remember those? Those people who wouldn't, who wouldn't take one side or the other, and, and sometimes they pretend to be on one side, and then they pretend to be on the other? That's pretty much how Adam Steedham was. Well, turns out Adam Steedham told Bloody Bill Cunningham uh, where Colonel Brandon or Uncle, Uncle Thomas and uh, James Williams were camped and they surrounded the camp uh, just before daylight. My brother John, turns out, was on sentry duty and of course he saw them, fired at them, sounded the alarm. Well, that drew their fire and it killed John one other and wounded a few others before they could escape. Well, that's the only vow I ever took was that morning. And that vow, I tore my shirt off, I threw it in the dust, and I said, I'm going to kill Bloody Bill Cunningham and Adam Steedham if it's the last thing I ever do. Now, I was all about the cause. I've been begging to go in to fight in the mounted militia uh, for, oh, almost uh, six months or more, but my mother wouldn't let me go because John and my father were in. So I understood the cause, and we all thought, you remember the cause, the cause of liberty. That's what Scots-Irish, the Germans, all of us really wanted up there. Now, not all of us. Of course, there were some who, who chose the crown. You remember the Tories. And those of you who, how many of you are Presbyterians? God bless you. Uh -huh. Oh, Mr. Baxley, I see you over there. God bless you. You know, they all fought for it. I didn't know one Presbyterian uh, that didn't fight for, for the cause. Now, but how many of you are Baptists? We see. Oh yes. Well, you did. You had trouble making up your minds. About half of you were on Tories, and the other half were Whigs. How many of you were Methodists? Did you laugh at the Baptists? You shouldn't, because you did the same thing they did. Uh, but I have it on good authority that it's a really good chance that your ancestors fought for the Patriots, because mostly in South Carolina they gave 90 days to get out after it was over. So you're you're still here as evidence that you probably your ancestors chose the right side. You remember what upset us the most? 
It, was, it wasn't just taxation without representation. It was that this is our land. You know, they stole our land in Scotland hundreds of years before, but this was our land. And then they put the, that tax that stuck in our crawl the most. And that was when they taxed us to pay for the Anglican church. You remember that? And we couldn't even call ourselves our congregation's churches. It was a, and for us, it was a Duncan Creek Presbyterian meeting house. And you Methodists had meeting houses. We, remember, they wouldn't even let, they wouldn't even recognize our marriages. So we ran around, all of us had illegitimate children because of the crown, can you imagine? And then they taxed us, so, well, I go on too long. Let me get back to my story. My father brought John's body down and we buried him the next day. I got his shoes. I had a gross spurt, my shoes were gone. You know, remember back then, if you had one pair of shoes, you were doing pretty well. And so I got John's shoes. I didn't know if I could really ever fit in them, not physically, of course, but uh, as the man that he was. Uh, but I decided I was going to replace John. And so um, I was determined. And my father and Uncle Thomas agreed, and my mother had to agree, and uh, we buried John. I remember old Red was his dog. We had him tied up about a mile away, and that dog mourned. It was the most sorrowful song, uh, sorrowful sound I believe I've ever heard. Well, we buried him the next day. Uncle Thomas and I took off. My eye was excited. I got all the accoutrements. I was riding my best horse dot, my 54 caliber rifle, and um, a blanket and a, and a canteen, all the things that you take. And I was excited and I wanted to fill uh, John's place. Well, we went to a camp, I believe it was over near the Broad River. When we rode up, it was wonderful. I saw my cousin uh, Chris was there, Chris Brandon, and uh, oh, several other people. Uh, William Kennedy was there, and so I messed banks. And we knew each other mostly from church or we were related to each other. And so there we were. Now, let me tell you a little bit about it. When you camped out, and, and it sounds like a lot of fun until you camp out about three or four days. Let me tell you, anything that could stick, sting, or bite <laughs> would stick, sting, or bite you. And, and we slept on pine needles. Anyone here ever slept on pine needles? Oh, it sounds nice. It's just wonderful. Until you start rolling around in the middle of the night, those things will stick you where you didn't even know you had places to be stuck. <laughs> anyway. And when it rained, guess what? We had no tents. It, we got wet. When it snowed, we got snowed upon. That's pretty much the way it was. But we were for the cause. We learned very quickly. Carry your spoon with you because anytime you could get something to eat, you needed to eat. We never knew when we were going to get something to eat, uh, and we never knew if we were going to get enough. But we did all that. The first memorable thing that happened to me was sentry duty. I've been there about two weeks. Sergeant Tate says, Young, uh, you're on sentry duty tonight. Oh, that made me feel proud. That's great. I just wanted to prove myself. Uh, as worthy of being fight, as, as being a fighter in that militia. Well, he took me out that evening, uh, just about a little before dusk, and he says, you, you understand your responsibility? Of course, I did. And he, he was out about 300 yards uh, from the camp. And he says, here's the password. We were near the Tiger River then. He says, the password is Tiger. If anyone shows up and they can't give you the password, shoot them. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Well, I sat down, everything's wonderful, it's a pleasant day, much like today, and the sun's going down, I was thinking back through lots of things, and, and then I began to think about, wait a minute, John was killed on sentry duty, and then it got darker and darker, and I began to hear the noises as you hear in your imagination, what, is that bush moving, or what, was, was that just the wind? Uh, or was that stump, was that stump over there, is that a person? And pretty soon it gets darker and darker. Then the, the wolves begin to howl. Well, uh, one wolf isn't a problem, but three, four, five wolves, you, it takes you a full minute to load your rifle. And so that began to worry me a little bit. And then I heard it, the first thing, just a little faint footstep, a little twig popped, and then another footstep, and another footstep is coming straight for me. Somebody's coming right for me. And of course, I yelled, Stop! What's the password? Dead silence. Then another step, step, kept coming toward me. Who goes there? What's the password? Now it's within about 35 yards of me. I, he, I said, who goes there? What's the password? Dead silent. Now I'm thinking, my mind's racing, my heart's beating. I figured it out. It's probably one of those 
damn Cherokees. They were fighting for the British. They don't understand English. What's my dilemma? How many of them are there? I can picture a tomahawk slashing through that dark air. And so I stood up, I aimed, now I could see something just about 30 yards away. Here he comes, I said, what's the password? No answer, boom, I shot him. Boom, his body hit the ground. Well, I jumped behind the tree, reloaded as fast as I could because you don't know how many people were there. About that time, Sergeant Tate and William Kennedy came running up. Young, young. I said, over here, Sarge. He said, what happened? I told him the story. He said, where'd he fall? I said, right over there, about 30 yards. He rushed over there in Kennedy. He looked down. It's a horse. You've killed a horse, young. Oh, I was never so embarrassed in all my life. Oh, can you imagine? 16 years old, I'm trying to be a man. And of course, all the way back, uh, Kennedy was calling me, Young the horse killer, Young the way, well, you know that stuck. So the next day, I was Young the horse killer. People come by to meet Young the horse killer all over. But that night, a great thing happened. Colonel Brandon, uh, Colonel James Williams, and my father all came to see me. Lots of people around, just about like this. And uh, they said, Well, Thomas, uh, this was uh, uh, James Williams, said, Thomas, this is two things I want to tell you. One, you did exactly the right thing. And two, we have it on good authority, it was a Tory horse. <laughs> so that made me feel better. Things went along pretty well until I got to go to my first uh, fight. And I wouldn't call it a big battle, but it was a battle. And that's Stallions. Maybe you've heard of Stallions Plantation. It's not too far from here, probably 100 miles up toward the, uh, uh, up, uh, toward the present day little village of Rock Hill, uh, just south of the uh, uh, Catawba River. Well, I volunteered along with Chris and my messmates. We all went there, really about 50 of us, and Uncle Thomas is the one who was in charge, and he, he met up with a Captain Love. Now, the, we had intelligence that Mr. Stallions was uh, holding a little convention, if you will, of a bunch of Tories, and they were developing their strategies to come out and see how they were gonna raid um, our plantations when we were out in the field. You know how they do, they throw rocks in your well, and sometimes it was getting pretty bad, pretty serious. By this time, some of the barns were being burned, they'd harass the, the women folks. So we decided to stop that. Well, turns out Captain Love was the brother of Mrs. Stallions. So here was the plan. We were gonna surround the house and he was gonna to try to negotiate a surrender. So we put the horses about 300 yards back, we got off and we walked. So now we're infantry and we're walking in a line straight up to the house. I'm with Captain Love and uh, Uncle Thomas on, rides around the back of the house with about 25 men, 25 in front. And we got right up within about 30 yards of the house, and I could see the rifle barrels start sticking out of the upstairs windows and the downstairs windows, and we're completely exposed. Uh, but there we are. And as luck would have it, Mrs. Stallion saw us coming, and she came running right out of the house, and she said, William, William, don't fire upon my house, don't fire upon my house. And we're on, he said, sis, he says, we won't, and we won't have to if you'll go back and negotiate a surrender. Tell your husband he's surrounded and he should surrender. Whereupon, if you know the story, she turned and ran back, and just as her foot jumped up on the front step, the firing began in the back of the house. A bullet came all the way through the hallway, through the front door, hit her in the chest, and threw her back out into the yard and where she lay dead. Well, that was the end of the surrender. The fighting commenced then. So, and let me tell you something right now. If anybody ever tells you that they've been in a battle and they weren't afraid, they're lying to you. Or they weren't in a battle in the first place. Because you are afraid. There's all sorts of mixtures of emotions. Fear and anger and excitement all at one time. I can hardly explain it. All I know is they were shooting at me so that I, every time I fast as I could load, I'd shoot back at them. Of course, smoke was every place. You could hardly tell if you ever hit anyone. And even if you did, if some might have been the person beside you, it didn't matter. We, our game was to outshoot them. And pretty soon we did. One fell, another fell. I looked up at one point, there were, looked like two of them out the same window, pointing right at me and William Kennedy. And I said, jump, William, jump. They got a beat on us. And I jumped and they missed me, but they hit him. He didn't jump. I hit him through the wrist, terrible injury, and through the thigh. Now the good news is, lest you worry about him. He came back in about six months, right at, at time for cow pens. So uh, William was one of the lucky ones, but he was our only casualty. 
And we ended up, I think now, it's hard to remember, but uh, maybe three, three killed and three or four wounded. But that was my first engagement. Now, the next major engagement is one that was a pivotal engagement, and the historians today are, beginning, are saying that, of course we knew it back then, uh, of the turning of the Great Rebellion, and that was King's Mountain. How many of you have been to King's Mountain? Oh, they've preserved it, you know. If you haven't been over there, you should get over there. It's just wonderful. It's not really a mountain, of course. It's about six, let's see, it's about 150 feet high, 600 feet long, and about 250 feet wide. It was pretty steep, except for the north area where it's a slope. That's where they had these uh, the uh, bayonet charges. That's where I was, as a matter of fact. And I remember our plan, we all met, we met the over the mountain men. Uh, they came down through uh, Sycamore Shoals over the Watauga and down. They came from all over in what is now Tennessee and Virginia and Georgia, the Carolinas. We all met and we had a good intelligence that <clears throat> Patrick Bulldog Ferguson, you remember that guy, Pat, he best shot in the British Army. In fact, developed that wonderful Ferguson rifle. You might remember a breech loader. Well, Ferguson had all these uh, these uh, Tories with him, of course trained by British provincials they called them, I think. Anyhow, they, so they had Tories. Of course they all looked, most of them looked like us, wore the same clothes. I remember uh, uh, Colonel, or, uh, yeah, it was Colonel James, he, he said, here's the standard. We put a little white paper in our hats so we can tell who's the, who were the good guys. And of course they wore little uh, sprigs of, of uh, evergreen. You might remember that. Well, Ferguson made a big mistake. Big mistake. He sent couriers out all over up in the upstate and all over the back country saying roughly something words to this effect. If you don't come under my standard, that's the flag. If you don't come under my standard, we're gonna waste your farms and your land with fire and sword. Well, that's when the over the mountain men, you'll recall probably, they remember, they said, what? If they can do it there, they can do it here. They can pick us off one unit, one community at a time. So that was it. He shouldn't have threatened us like that. The game, the strategy was very easy. We're gonna surround that mountain. And then with one shot, we're gonna give out the Indian war hoop and up the mountain we go. Seemed like a good plan. So we did that. We rode all the way through the rain one cold day. This is in October the 7th, I believe. In fact, in fact the anniversary was just recently. We rode from Calpins all the way over, surrounded it, uh, the area, and sure enough, just before the fire, the shot was fired, a woman came running down the mountain, can you imagine? And there she came. And, and she was screaming something. Finally, she got real close to Uncle Thomas, and you could hear her, she says, I don't want any part of this battle, let me go. And Uncle Thomas said, how do we know you're telling us the truth and what are you doing here, that sort of thing. And she says, well, you can tell that I'm on your side because I'm gonna tell you where uh, Ferguson is. Ferguson's up th right up there, he'll be blowing a whistle, and he's on a white charger, and he's wearing a red and white ch uh, checkered shirt. Well, that seemed good enough, and he let her go. Her name was Virginia, which, oh, that gives me pause for a moment. You know, I don't know how these British officers had needed two women to tend to them, but he at least never got mixed up. He was pretty smart because both ladies were named Virginia. <laughs> pretty, I, I always remember that as a 16 year old. Anyhow, so uh, sure enough, the shot was fired. We gave the Indian war open up, we went. Now, they had mostly British issued muskets which could fire three times per minute. That gave them an advantage. Uh, we fired one time a minute, but those rifles were far more accurate. And we were shooting, remember, 150 feet, but time you go way down, you're shooting maybe 100 yards up there. So we thought we had the advantage, and we did, until they put their bayonets on. And they'd wait until we fired a volley, then they'd, have, they'd charge us with their bayonets. Now, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you, John's shoes had worn out. Have you ever had shoes with a sole that starts flip-flopping? <laughs> well, I knew I couldn't wear those in a battle. I'd be falling down and probably get myself killed, so I threw the shoes away. Now, folks, if you ever want to know what it's like to fight at King's Mountain, the next time you're over there, just take your shoes off and run up and down that mountain about three times. You'll see what it was really like. And that's what it was for me. But I didn't worry about my my feet. I was worried about the cause, and I will tell you, I had my eyes peeled for, uh, for uh, Bloody Bill Cunningham and Adam Steedham. Well, up we went. 
pretty soon. Smoke everywhere. We're shooting. At one point, I'm behind a tree, and I, I'll shoot, and I get my reload and shoot. And they had a pretty good beat on me because they knocked the, the bark off of the side of that tree on both sides. My eyes got pretty well full, full of it. But up we went anyway. Kept going. Charged down three times. We'd get reload, fire, they go back up. Finally, we got up. What inspired me the most was our own Colonel James Williams. He rode up that slope on his horse. Couldn't believe it. Come on, men with his sword. That's the thing that got us to go over the top. We're following him until his horse gets shot. His horse goes down, he slipped off it, much nimbler than a than a 40-some-year-old guy I thought could be, but he slipped right off of it, charged on up again, got within about 15 yards, took two bullets in the body. I couldn't believe it. He was our neighbor, our best friend, our he taught Sunday school. Anyway, up I ran to him and his little brother, or his little son Daniel ran up there too. And he sort of came to and he said, don't stop, take the hill, take the hill. So on up I went, up the hill, I got there just in time to see Patrick Bulldog Ferguson take seven or eight shots, almost instantaneously, instantaneously. Off he went of that white horse, and of course it dragged him, his foot got caught in the stirrup, and dragged him away until the Tories finally got it stopped. And that's when his second in command yelled, we surrender, we surrender. Well, it was over the mountain, man. You know what they did? They yelled, Tarleton's quarter, Tarleton, and they kept shooting him. And I, that was a terrible scene because they'd throw their rifles down. You remember Tarleton's Quarter. You know, it's over there where you live, Mr. Baxley. The Waxhaws over that or north of Camden, I guess. And when, when uh, the, Tarleton reputedly um, uh, didn't give any quarter to many of Buford's men. Of course, I understand there's two sides to every story, but it was politically uh, convenient, I think, at the time because it would rally more people to join the Patriot cause. Well... Uh, that was the end. Finally, the officers got control of them. They stopped them, uh, and, and then I was delighted to see, I didn't see Bloody Bill Cunningham, but I did see Adam Steedham. And we, you know, that was 900 men to 900 men, if you can imagine. But we took, oh gosh, I've forgotten how many now. I think they told me around 700. Uh, we took prisoners. Uh, they had about 240 killed or somewhere of that. We only lost 29 men. Of course, we had some wounded. But we figured we better get out of there pretty fast because General Cornwallis himself was at Charlotte. That was only 30 miles away. We figured he'd be coming back and we couldn't take another fight like that right now. So we took the 10 most notorious Tories, including Adam Steedham, and we hot-footed it toward Rutherford County <clears throat> to the west, get away from Cornwallis should he come over. And the prisoners went on up, I've forgotten, Salisbury, Hillsborough, someplace. Uh, but we took them, and that night we held a trial. Now, I'm pleased to tell you that these hands put the rope around Adam Steedham's neck. Now, I'll, we prayed for him. I prayed for him. I'm a Christian, you know. We prayed for his soul, but he had to pay for what he did. And I couldn't get beyond what he did to John. His mouth killed John as much as of one of Bloody Bill's bullets killed John. Then we left. And we hadn't eaten anything. Oh, I remember that since the cow pens the night before. So now we've gone 24 hours and we split up. The over the mountain men are going back. We're running, uh, going home, riding home and starving. And that next afternoon, it must have been right around noon, we saw a pumpkin patch. We we're so pleased because Uncle Thomas stopped. Out we went. Oh man, it was October, of course. Have you ever tried roast pumpkin when you haven't eaten for about 30 hours? It was wonderful. I remember it like yesterday. It was just terrific. And Chris uh, Brandon pulled out to our great delight tea. It was that black tea. It was wonderful. Can you imagine what a delicacy it was to have tea and roast pumpkin? Well, it was terrific. We built the fire real fast, and we got the tea, threw the tea in, and it's bubbling from water from a little rivulet. And pretty soon, Chris says, pour mine first, boys. He says, we looked over there. There comes a Jersey cow come on over, coming our way, walking across the pasture. I guess she was going to get some of her pumpkins you know, also. And he says, I'm going to have cream in my tea. Well, here he went while we're catcalling and laughing and wandering and taking bets and all of that. And of course, he was a farmer. He get, got real close to that cow and that cow's eyes are rolling and she's pretty skittish, but he gets underneath her just as he gets ready to get him a little squirt. 
Sergeant Tate said, bellows it. Boots and saddles, boys, boots and saddles. Well, she kicked, imagine a jump that kicked that, that cup clear out of his hands there with his teeth flying through the air. We didn't have tea for at least another three weeks. And as, as, as my memory recollects, uh, after that, he always took his tea black. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me get to Fort Mott. There are lots of other things, including cow pens, where on my 17th birthday, I was uh, able to lead, I was a captain then, I was able to lead a unit in a cavalry charge, uh, backing up uh, Colonel William Washington, the general's cousin, as you know. It was quite a wonderful thing. And so that cow pens was quite a fight. I'll share that for another time. Oh, you can read it. I, I wrote it in my memoirs. Uh, oh, as a matter of fact, they'll be right out there. Uh, there's a book out there if you want one of these. Now, listen to this. Cow pens, I made a big mistake. I got greedy. Tarleton, you know, we whipped him soundly. Old Dan Morgan, he said we would and we believed him. We whipped him. He went running off and his, his dragoons and the rest of them went running off up the Green River Road to get away from us. Well, my mistake was uh, Sergeant Tate and several of us, Captain Jolly, we decided, or Major Jolly at that time, we decided we would chase them and catch the wagons and so on. That was a mistake because we caught one and I was bringing it back with the prisoners by myself when I was overtaken by a group of about 10 dragoons. Uh, I suffered uh, six major wounds and was <coughs> taken captive. And oh, I heard the, the sweetest words I ever heard in my life then. I, they had knocked me off the horse. You can still see the scars where they got me right across here, one through the shoulder blade. The last one's in the head, I'm off on the ground and I could barely hear and in the haze and I heard this kindly British major say, don't kill him, he's just a child. <laughs> well. I was taken prisoner, interrogated by Bannister Tarleton, and I must tell you, he was a handsome man, he treated me kindly. Uh, and then, uh, but anyway, uh, I lived through it, obviously, I'm here. And then after that, Fort Mott, we had some other things too, you know, uh, that I'm skipping around, Musgrove's Mills, Blackstock, but Fort Mott was interesting because I got to fight with the famous General Francis Marion. Oh, what a wonderful opportunity that was. We rode all the way down here to surround that fort that, that the British had taken over, Mrs. Mott's house, you remember, and not far from here on the Congaree River. Well, uh, when I got there, I was astounded because I had him, his, his profile didn't live up to his reputation. He was about this big, but I thought he was a giant. He was so popular, we loved him so much. Well, there we were, and uh, he had several, uh, uh, he had had several hours of contemplating the strategy and finally decided they just put it under siege and then was it Rowden I think it was was coming close and they decided that siege thing isn't going to work because the British are going to catch us and so he went to Mrs. Mott and he says we have only one strategy one thing we can do he says uh, and that is we have to f burn down your house she didn't hesitate you probably know, how many of you know that story well, well let me see let me read to you another a young patriot wrote his memoirs, and I have them here, and that's uh, William Doby and James. Anybody know William Doby and James? Oh, okay, well let me read. Now how am I gonna do this? Would you hold this contraption, this device? Thank you so much. Now, let me get my spectacle. Here's what he wrote, and you get it straight, because he was there too. I may have met him, but I'm not real sure but were kindred souls. He says, although so weak after the affair at Hopkirk, General Green had sent a reinforcement to Marion under Major Eaton with a six pounder, and on the 8th of May, Marion and Lee commenced firing upon Fort Mott. As soon as General Green heard of the retreat of Lord Rawdon from Camden, he decamped from Corals Creek, and moving down on the west bank of the water, he took a position near McCord's Ferry so as to cover the besiegers. Fort Mott stood on a high hill called Buckhead, a little on the right of the Charleston Road, where it leaves the Congaree below McCord's. Within its walls was included the house of Mrs. Mott, who had retired to that of her overseer. When told it was necessary to burn the house in order to take the fort expeditiously, she at once requested it should be done, and as a means of effecting it, furnished an Indian bow and arrows. On the night of the 10th, the fires of Lord Rowden's, Rowden's camp were seen on the Santee Hills in his retreat from Camden, and encouraged the garrison for a while, but it encouraged them for a while, but on the 12th, the house was set on fire, and Commander Lieutenant McPherson and 165 men surrendered. 
Oh, what did we say back then? Do you remember? We lose these good words. We used to, when something good happened, what would we say? Huzzah. Remember? So, now let me read this again. It says here, it says, the house was set fire uh, and Commander Mc, Lieutenant McPherson and 165 men surrendered. Hip hip! Huzzah! Huzzah! Hip hip! Huzzah! You got your with me. Stay in there. All right, now, uh, here we go. This deed of Ms. Mott had been deservedly celebrated. Her intention to sacrifice her valuable property was patriotic, but the house was not burnt. As it's state, it stated by historians, nor was it fired by an arrow from an African bow, as sung by the poet, uh, uh, sung by the poet Nathan Savage, a private American.